Welcome everyone um, to uh, a fresh season of Pushing Beyond the Obvious, which is a podcast that helps leaders. Uh, this is the leadership series, which means that uh, uh, this entire season is going to uh, talk about the different aspects of leadership, uh, different nuances of uh, leadership uh, as well. So I'm really, really happy to have Gihan join us today. Um, um, you know, instead of me introducing you, I think it is a good idea for you to introduce yourself, the body of work that you've done, and probably answer this question. If you really, really knew me, you would know that. Complete the sentence. Oh, okay. All right. Thanks, Mukesh, and um, thank you so much for inviting me to be to be part of this. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, so I'm a business futurist, and uh, it's interesting, Mukesh, that you said this series is all about leadership, and that uh, very much. I'm a leadership futurist, so lots of people. And what is the thing you said? If you if you really knew me, you would say yes. So look, lots of people think futurists talk about technology, and I have got a technology background. So um, I've grown up in Australia, I live in Perth, in Western Australia, in um, same as you do, Mukesh, in the world's biggest time zone. And um, I do have this tech background. But if you really knew me, you would know that I'm really interested, not in the technology by itself, but what technology facilitates for people, and particularly for leaders, because I think we've got a, a lot of change happening in our world, and we really need leaders to step up and be ready to lead that change. And whether or not you've got leader on your business card or not, or it's part of your title, or um, you've had this experience as a formal leader, uh, all of us are being invited to step up and be leaders now. So that's my area of futurism. It's absolutely is talking about technology, but specifically around what that means for us as, as leaders um, using that technology to build a better world. Super. So um, I always say that leadership is not a position, but it is a decision. So as long as you decide that you want to be leader, uh, you can lead from wherever you are in the organization as well. Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it, Mukesh, and I haven't heard that before. Um, but and, and especially after we've had you know, like a global pandemic, so a global crisis like this, I think what happened in that early in the, in the COVID-19 pandemic was that leaders sprung up from everywhere. There were the some of the traditional leaders who were already good leaders. They amplified their leadership and they took on even more responsibility uh, to, to lead their people through this change. But then there were also some leaders who, again, they weren't officially leaders, but as you said, they, they made a decision that they were going to step up and um, you know, leaders sprung up from unexpected places. And that's just going to continue because we do live in a lot of uncertainty now and that's going to continue forever. Uh, so uh, very well said. So I was talking to a couple of my friends um, uh, earlier today, saying that you know I'm going to talk to you and that you are a business futurist. And uh, uh, the question that they popped up to me was, you know, what what does a business futurist mean, and what do they actually do? So if you can just double click on that a little bit before we kind of move into talking about the book that uh, uh, we wanted to talk about as well. Yeah, sure. Look, and, and you know, when I started on this journey as a futurist, I didn't call myself a futurist because nobody really knew what that, they never, they'd never even heard of that term. And now people have heard of it, but they have lots of uh, ideas and, um, you know, misconceptions about what a futurist is. So, the, so first, and just so I don't disappoint you, Mukesh, I need to tell you that I can't predict the future. So I'm sorry about that. So if you want me to make predictions about what's going to happen tomorrow or who's going to win an election or the results of some lottery, then I'm not the right person for that. Um, so what futurists do is rather than looking at predicting the future, what we look at are trends and um, innovations and um, it's, you know, it may be technology, it may be social trends and looking at making them relevant and meaningful. So in fact, some of the things are things that are already happening, but they may not be happening in your area, in your country, in your organization, in your industry. So as a futurist, I can look at this and say, here's something happening with artificial intelligence in healthcare, and it could be relevant for if you were in um, um, real estate or banking. So that's some of the things that futurists do. So trying to give you more certainty about the future. Now, I can't give you 100% certainty, but I can help you get a bit more certainty 
so you've got more clarity and confidence as a leader so you can make better decisions now so as much as it's talking about the future the whole point of understanding the future is to help you make better decisions now especially as a leader super so i remember reading a, a book i'm i'm forgetting the name of the author now so the book was called force uh, um uh flash foresight if i remember correctly okay. and the author in that book talks about hard trends and soft trends uh he talks about uh, hard trends like for example um, demographic uh, age uh, so it is a known fact that at a point in time uh, the demographic what a demographic of a particular country uh, would look like Uh, that's a hard trend because that's something that you cannot change or it's bound yeah. to happen and uh, there are soft trends uh, which for example technology enabled or uh, digital enabled or uh, things like that which could potentially happen and may not happen as well so uh, and how you uh, this make decisions based on hard trends and then adjust for soft trends so that was interesting so in your book disrupted right so you talk about uh, uh, three phases of leading through uncertainty so i think we are probably in in the era when it comes to um, uh, leading under conditions of uncertainty today because you know because of all the different uh, reasons pandemic uh, and supply chain disruptions and uh, you know workplace disruptions and uh, working from home working from office working hybrid there is just enormous amount of uncertainty today and uh, you talk about a uh, interesting model uh, uh, around how to lead in such an environment can you just expand on that a little bit yeah sure so and um, and i wrote that book during the pandemic to help leaders lead through the time where we went through this major not just uncertainty but we went through a major disruption we went through a major crisis and it's almost like for the first time for most people that they'd been through like the whole world had been through something like this so the three phases are crisis recovery and growth and leaders have to operate differently in each of those phases so if you think about it like a boat in a storm and uh, and also remember mukesh you um, i don't know i'm sure you've heard people say this at the time you heard people say uh, we're all in the same boat okay it's actually not true and uh, during the during the pandemic we were all in the same storm but different people had different boats to navigate through that storm but you can imagine a boat that was caught in the storm and the boat was sinking and then what do you do as a leader when the boat's sinking the number one priority the only thing you do you forget about all your long term plans you forget about your destination where you're going to all you have to do is make sure that you get the water out and then and, and um fix the leak because otherwise you're not going to go any further so that's the crisis phase and there at that phase as a leader you've really short term focus and then after that you can start looking at recovery then you can look at saying oh, you know what the boat's stable now we can we must still be in the storm so we've still got to navigate our way out of the storm we're still not making very very long term plans because we're still not at the stage where we can set sail again to our destination but at least we're over that crisis so when that recovery stage and then the last stage is the growth stage where you say okay now we're ready now we're moving into the future and i think at each of those stages leaders have to do something differently and um for many people and for many leaders they haven't had to deal with a crisis like that it's not true for everybody so i work with a lot of industries so financial planners uh, in australia like every year there's some new regulations about how they need to operate so they have to change every year um aged care uh, again it's not just demographic changes which they can predict as you said you can predict that we're going to have an aging population they're going to need more um um uh, residential care they're going to need more health care so you can predict that but you know in a country like australia every year almost every year the government says we need to change the aged care system so they're just scrambling things have to change so they go through this crisis it's just that everyone now has been through a major crisis which was covid and we're going to continue to have crises in the future so the first thing is understand where you are are you at crisis are you at recovery are you at growth and the trick is it's not just for your business your organization it's sometimes is for the whole industry sometimes for the whole country and actually sometimes even for individuals so everybody had a different boat in that storm uh, right down to an individual level 
there are some people who maybe they still had a job, but their partner or somebody in their family was sick or they lost their job. So a lot of, lot of leaders had to deal with that crisis for the first time ever. So I think the first thing you can do is understand where you are with each of your people, crisis, recovery or growth, and then look at where you, where you go from there. So there is a popular uh, uh, you know, meme as well, right? That uh, never let a crisis go for waste, which means that you know, in a crisis moment, that's probably also one of uh, uh, one of the opportunities uh, of a lifetime uh, because uh, you can leapfrog your competition. So, how does that kind of you know figure in your uh, model as well? Yeah, yeah, exactly right. You're exactly right, Mukesh. And this is one of the things that, um, so some people, some organizations, they chose. So what most organizations did was they said, here's a crisis. Then we need to get out of the crisis, go to recovery, and then grow. Some people fast track that. And they said, you know, there's a fourth stage to this, which is disruption. And some people, some organizations uh, disrupted themselves. And some came in and said, the rest of the world is in crisis. Let's see how we can disrupt that. Because what happens in a crisis is that everybody starts to, once, once they're through the worst of the crisis, they start to reassess, reevaluate, um, re, they just start looking at their priorities again, some of their life priorities, some of their work priorities. You mentioned some of these earlier, Mukesh, uh, people deciding whether they're going to spend more time working from home. Maybe they're going to work in a four day work week or a three day work week or bring forward their retirement and they look at their expenses because um, inflation and high rising costs mean that they need to start considering these things. So when everything's going really smoothly, people say, oh, I'm pretty happy with what I've got. I'm not necessarily going to look around at the competition. I'm not going to look for better options. But when there's a crisis, they start reevaluating all of that. And then that's when the smart, savvy disruptors come in and they say, look, we've got something better to offer you. And it's actually, in some ways, it's easier to disrupt in a crisis. Uh, companies like Uber, so Uber was launched during the GFC, during the global financial crisis. And in some ways, it's easier for a company like Uber to disrupt then because people are looking for alternatives. So absolutely. So you say never let a good crisis go to waste. And not everyone can do that. Not everybody wants to do it, but it does create opportunities. And I often say to, the, to, to my clients, the leaders I work with, even if your business and your industry wasn't, didn't have to go through a crisis, through COVID or through the disruptions, just be aware because your customers might now be looking at alternatives. And this is where other little small savvy startup agile companies are coming in and offering your customers something different and they might be ready to take that. Interesting. So uh, if I understand, correctly what you're saying is that uh, uh, times of disruption or times of crisis are like portals of transition where people are more open to change uh, than at any other point in time so which means that if you if they get better alternatives uh, based on whatever it is that they are trying to change to uh, are open to uh, the chances that uh, they are able to number one scan through the environment for better opportunities um, and also change uh, make that necessary change is much higher and therefore organizations who are willing to uh, disrupt themselves and go into that direction have a better chance of success than in a stable environment. Yeah, exactly right, Mukesh. And I think the point is right. So the way you describe it is right. So there's, they can scan wider and they can change. Now, that, they can always do that, right? When everything's going well, you can still do that, but there's less motivation to do it. There's less incentive to do it. Um, so for example, like if I'm driving along the road in my car, and a stone hits my windscreen, and it doesn't necessarily shatter it completely, but it creates a tiny little, you know, a tiny little shattering. Now, that's dangerous. And um, here in Australia, you're not allowed to drive if your windscreen has been hit by a stone, even if it looks completely safe. Why? Because that stone wasn't the thing, isn't the thing that's caused the danger. It's actually the next stone that's going to hit it because it's suddenly that glass has now become brittle. And so it's the next thing that's really going to cause the, the disruption. And this is what's happened with lots of organizations that they don't realize that their customers not only um, you know, can look at alternatives, but they want to now. They're motivated to. And especially established companies, they still think they're 
I'm sorry, I shouldn't say they, all of them, uh, but many of them are thinking that yeah, it's back to business as usual, just like it was pre-pandemic or pre-supply chain disruption uh, or pre other any other disruption. And it's not true. Even if you haven't changed, your customers have changed. And it's crucial that you talk to them and find out what, what really matters to them now. Uh, interesting. So that kind of gives a good segue into uh, one of the things that you talk about in the first phase, which is empathy uh, that leaders need to have when it comes to, uh, you know, both their, the people that they're leading as well as the uh, their other stakeholders as well. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, if you can double down on that, uh, double click on that and talk to us about uh, what are some of the things uh, that, uh, uh, you know, leaders can do, number one, to uh, have to be empathetic towards uh, uh, the people that they're leading because even the leaders themselves are going through the crisis. They are also mm -hmm. in that phase where you know they want to first uh, secure themselves uh, and wh what they want to do from a crisis mode, and then probably you know look at stability and then uh, growth as well. And they are going through difficult times as well. Mm -hmm. So given that that's the case, how can one go about uh, you know having empathy for uh, others and Maybe, you know, you also talk about uh, trust at a later point in time in your book. Uh, as well. uh, maybe if you can just link both those, if there is a link, I think there is, but if you think there is a link as well, maybe, you know, link how that kind of, you know, how that empathy leads to the trust, which can then enable leaders to be much more effective than they would otherwise be. Yeah, okay. It's an interesting, interesting question, Mukesh. In, in, interesting with the way that you framed that. Um, so there's some research done early in the pandemic. And again, I'm going to quote some Australian research here because that's where most, most of my work is done. But this, this applies universally. So there's a university in Australia called Macquarie University. And they did some research in the middle of 2020. So right at the, the early part of the pandemic, people did, didn't really know what was going to happen in the future, right in the crisis point. And they looked at leaders around Australia and they tried to identify what the best leaders were doing. And they came up with this metaphor, uh, which I love, I wish I thought of it myself. They call it the avocado leader. So the avocado leader, they say, the best leaders in a in time of crisis are like an avocado. So they have, the, they have the hard inner core, which is looking at business outcomes and KPIs and performance and making sure that the business or the organization is still meeting its goals. But it also has a soft outer layer, which is looking after the people. And so the best leaders are doing both of those things in a crisis. Now, it's actually true that the best leaders do that at all times, crisis or not. And the crisis just um, means it requires all leaders to step up. And so around the soft outer layer are things like empathy and trust. And empathy, I mean, people will have different uh, definitions of it. But to me, I think the key part of this is understanding the motivation behind people's behavior. So it's doing a little bit of mind reading here because uh, I, if I'm trying to understand what you're going through, Mukesh, uh, I can't read your mind. I don't know what emotions you're feeling. All I can do is judge that by what I can see, what I can hear. Um, you know, if we were there physically, we could touch. Um, and it's really everything that we get is through our five senses. And then we make up in our head what the other person is thinking, feeling, and uh, what they're going through. And empathy is saying, actually, you know, I'm, I'm not going to judge just my own mind reading. It's actually trying to find out what's the motivation behind your, behind your behavior. So the behavior is what I see and hear, but what's actually going on. And it's me understanding that better. Uh, so that's it's really really important for leaders to do, and um, you know I don't, I don't want to f I don't want to only say that it's relevant in times of crisis. It's not for all leaders at all times. That skill of empathy is more important than ever before. It's one of those outer layers of the avocado. I'm um, same with trust, um, and I, I just want to make a distinction here, Mukesh, because I'm not quite a little, well. Let me let me put it this way: There's two ways of looking at trust. There's a leader being trusted. So how do I build trust so that people trust me? And I think I think the more, the more valuable part of trust in the future is leaders trusting their people. Mm -hmm. Even 
the more junior people, even the people who've been in the organization for less, who've come in from outside the industry, who don't have the years of experience that the leaders do, they don't have necessarily the depth of technical expertise, but I think it's more important now than ever before for leaders to build trust in their people. And the, the reason I say that is because um, leadership has changed and it's changed in a radical way. And the, the way it's changed is that in the past, like say if you've been a leader for 20 to 30 years, 20 or 30 years ago, if you're thinking about what's the future going to look like, the future was moving more slowly. So the future would look more like the past. So your all your years of experience and everything you've learned in the past was probably going to stand you in good stead for being able to lead in the future. Now that's no longer the case. It's not that everything that you knew is completely useless. It's just that it's not automatically useful. And leaders really, like you need a bit of humility to be able to say, you know what? Um, so look, for me, it's been uh, probably 30 years since I had my first leadership role. And I've got to be able to say, you know what? The stuff that I learned as a leader 30 years ago, I shouldn't automatically assume that it's going to serve me well as a leader in the future. There are other people who are, you know, who've got different experience, different expertise, diverse ways of thinking, and lots of different lived experiences. And they are um, as qualified, sometimes even more qualified, to understand the future than I am. And I think that's that's the really that's I think a more valuable part of trust. It's a little bit harder for leaders to do sometimes to start trusting their people. So if you want to go deeper in that, happy to do that. But uh, I think that's a really? that's a more valuable part of trust. Yeah, I, I think it requires a, a little bit of a deeper uh, conversation. Uh, you bring out very, very uh, interesting point. I mean, maybe I, I did not think of uh, trust uh, as in leaders trusting their, the people that they lead um, uh, in that point of view when I asked you the question. But now that you mentioned that, I think uh, um, one of the, one of the um, aspects of leaders that uh, Roger Martin talks about in his book, Democracy, and I've written about it in the past as well, is uh, uh, the fact that uh, more and more organizations need to be able to delegate decision-making authority uh, to the front line because the things are changing so fast uh, in the marketplace that uh, if you have a, a hierarchical organization where you know the frontline staff uh, shares the input to their first line managers, they then share it to their middle managers, middle managers sharing it with senior managers, senior managers sharing it with CEO, and then the CEO sitting in a C-suite deciding, okay, what do we do? We need to respond to this or not? And by the time uh, the information comes back. The, the, the environment has already changed. Mm. Things have moved on. So one of the things that I've, I've always advocated uh, uh, to, with all leaders is that, you know, the more responsibility for action um, and response that you give to the frontline staff, the faster and more agile your organization is going to be. That's what startups do, right? So all of them are uh, able to decide at pace. Whereas in a large organization, because of the hierarchy, uh, the information, um, the time it takes for the information to pass back and forth is really high. So coming back to that, right? So one of the things that uh, I uh, I get pushed back on, um, and I would love to uh, get your perspective is, um, as a leader, um, let's say for example, I have a team where I have diverse people. So someone with five years experience, someone with two years experience, someone with five year, ten years experience, someone coming from a different industry, someone who's grown in my own uh, industry. Now the question is, whom can I trust and how much can I trust? Mm -hmm. perspective? Because uh, one of the things that we also need to understand is that uh, not everyone in the organization is deeply committed and is wanting to learn and is reflecting on what they're seeing. So a lot of times people are just, uh, you know, skimming the surface and just uh, skating uh, through. So how do I distinguish this? and uh, uh, identify whom can I trust and how much can I trust? Okay, so let me give you a very easy answer to that first question, who can you trust, right? So I reckon the, the easiest way to start this is to trust the people who actually want to be trusted more. 
So find the people. Tell I, I call them the champions. And you can talk about, let's say, innovation or change. And um, I work with lots of leaders who their, their organization is going through a change program, and they want everybody to change and go through transformation and um, you know embrace this idea of oh, we're change makers. And I said that's very difficult to do because not everybody wants to be a change maker. So you're better off doing the 80-20 rule and saying I'm going to. I'm going to allocate 80% of my time, my resources, my energy on the 20% of people who most want to change. And then, ideally, they'll then be shining lights for the rest of the team. Okay, so that's a, the that's a way to start. That's the way to start. The, the second thing is, what you said is exactly right. So you can't just throw everybody in at the deep end and say, go off and do this task. I'm going to trust you to do it. Come back when you're done. That's In fact, that's negligent. So that's bad leadership. So I reckon, so there's a number of stages in doing this, Makesh. And I, I think um, if we use the word uh, good judgment rather than trust, that's what I that's what I uh, encourage leaders to do, to build good judgment in their people. Um, so for example, Nordstrom, there's a, there's a retail company in the US, a big uh, department store called Nordstrom. And what Nordstrom does is they go through this um, so they've got their their external their external brand is about saying the customer's always right. We will do whatever we can for our customers. So there's this this famous story about um, so Nordstrom basically if customers come in and they want something, Nordstrom will do everything they can to serve the customer. There's this famous story about a customer who came to Nordstrom with a set of car tires for his car and said, "I want a refund for this." This is how much it cost me. And the customer service rep said, um, no worries, sir, here's your money back. Now, Nordstrom doesn't sell tires, doesn't sell car tires. Um, but this customer service rep uh, knew that the brand was going to be enhanced more than the, the money they'd lose on this transaction, even if it was a scammer. Okay, uh, But this isn't about customer service. This is about trust and judgment. Because Nordstrom employees are told, in fact, when they're going to work on their very first day after they've been recruited, they get given the employee manual and they get given this card. And the card says, uh, use your best judgment at all times. That's rule number one. And then there are no other rules. OK, so they're told we will trust you to use your good judgment at any time. But then there's the other thing. Uh, no, that's, by the way, that's the only thing that the employees are told. There are two other parts to that. The first is that Nordstrom goes through a very uh, rigorous recruitment process. So they recruit the best people. The second part of what they say is after this bit where they say, we will trust you and there's no other rules, is they say, your manager's door is open all the time. Please come and talk to her or him. So the, first of all, they make sure that there's an environment where they hire the best people so they can trust them more. And also they make sure that they, they have all the support that's required. Now, not all of us have the luxury to be like Nordstrom and say, we're gonna start off by hiring the best people. You've got who you've got. So you have to build trust step by step. So the people who you, first of all, identify the people who want more to, to be trusted more and then work through steps of building their judgment. And the way you do it is if you delegate a task, and, and, and this is like kind of leadership one to um, AM 101, right? This was done like 20 or 30 years ago. When you delegate a task to them, um, if you're not quite sure that you can fully trust them to do it, of course, you build in some guardrails. So say, Mukesh, you know, what, what would you like to do? Uh, or here's a task that you can do. Um, it's going to take a couple of weeks. Why don't you come back to me on Wednesday? And just let me know, just touch base to let me know where you're up to and where you're, um, you know, if you need me help with anything, rather than wait till the end of the two weeks. Also, obviously, I'm not going to take the most mission critical task and give it to somebody for the first time. Again, that's negligible. It's unfair on them as well as on, on the business. So you build judgment step by step. Uh, and the idea is that you get to the point and, and good judgment comes down to this. So I would say somebody's got good judgment if they know when they should be following the rules, the process, and they know when it's okay to break the rules and not follow the process, and they know when it's when they don't know. When they know to come back to the leader and say, you know what, I just want to check in with you before I do this, because I'm not sure whether I should follow the rules or break the rules. And I really like the perspective that you took, Mukesh, 
when you first introduced this question, that people have been delegating, leaders have been delegating for decades. But delegation used to be, the, the mindset around delegation used to be, I'm too busy to do everything and I'm going to be a bottleneck. So I'm going to delegate so that my productivity in, increases and improves. What you did was, what you said was exactly right for the future. So you do it for that reason, but also because that the people in the front line, things are changing so fast. The processes that we've got in place aren't necessarily relevant anymore. You can't wait for everything to go up the, the hierarchy. So what we want to do is in addition to improving our own productivity, we actually want to be more future ready as an organization. So yeah, absolutely. Do whatever you can to build better judgment in your people. Interesting. So I remember one of my newsletters uh, edition, um, I had written uh, the fact that, you know, uh, the first and foremost uh, uh, job of a leader uh, and the most critical aspect uh, job of a leader is to make judgment calls day in, day out, right? So that's all, uh, if you actually have to have significant impact on your organization, that's all you end up doing, which is, you know, making judgment calls day after day. So quick segue into, uh, you know, other responsibilities of uh, uh, leaders. So um, in your book, you also talk about the importance of leaders who kind of, you know, look into the realm of what is real today uh, and what is possible or probable tomorrow, which is a little bit about uh, thinking in terms of, you know, as a futurist uh, themselves. So can you maybe, you know, explain a little bit more about what does uh, uh, looking into the future mean and what are some of the things that leaders can do to build their ability or to learn mm -hmm. how to look um, uh, and probably see where the future is is kind of you know going towards. Yeah, and I think that's a really critical thing that leaders should be doing. And unfortunately, they're not most leaders aren't doing enough of that. And, and the reason for that is not because they don't want to do it; they'd love to do it, but they've got so many things happening that are from an operational basis and looking after the day to day that they don't make the time to to look up and look out. And, and yet, the more senior you are, the more of your salary is being paid for you to be thinking about the future. So if you're not doing that, you're not doing your job, right? And people, so I'm trying to be, I'm, I want to be compassionate here because I recognize that people have got many more demands on their time and their resources than ever, than ever. Um, and, you know, they're leaders who spend 80 plus percent of their time in meetings. Right? And I'm, I'm sure you've come across leaders like that, uh, or they spend all their time uh, going through their inbox. Uh, one leader famously said, uh, my job is deleting emails. Okay? Um, so there's I'm not saying um, that is easy, but it's essential that you look up and you look out. And especially now, because we live in such a connected world, it means looking at things that are outside your business, outside your uh, industry even, because there are going to be these things that are going to impact us and um, really have a, have a significant impact on us from completely outside our industry. Um, yeah, so again, there's, a, there's some research done by Accenture where they surveyed leaders and they said, where do you think the biggest disruptions are going to come from? And they said, are they going to come from um, existing competitors uh, within your market? Or are they going to come from outside? Um, and are they going to come from so existing businesses or new businesses? Or are they going to come from within the industry or outside? Now, I think you and I would agree, Mukesh, that there's going to be a whole bunch of disruptors who are going to come from businesses that don't exist now and from outside the industry. And yet most of the leaders surveyed, they said uh, they had very like blinkered view. They said our biggest our biggest competition is going to come from businesses we already know in our industry. And again, again, I can understand that because they're looking at market share, they're looking at short-term results, they're looking at stock prices. So they um, they've got this narrow focus. And yet we're going to have much more of that coming from outside. Um, I think the second part of your question is how can you look, how can you do those things? Like it's, e it's easy for me to say you need to do that, but what you're saying is how do you do it, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so I reckon there are three, three ways, there are three dimensions if you think about looking into the looking wider. Um, so, and they're, they're wide, deep, and far. So looking wider means getting wider perspectives than just your own. 
So it might mean talking to people outside or who you normally talk to. There might still be people within your organization, but if you're, let's say you're a senior leader and you spend a lot of time talking to other people, other senior leaders in your organization, that's good. But what about talking to more junior people? What about talking to new graduates? And what about doing reverse mentoring? So I'm sure you've come across the idea of reverse mentoring, yeah, Mukesh. Yeah, yeah. So the traditional mentoring is where the senior person mentors the more junior person. Reverse mentoring means that the more junior person is a, is a mentor. So one of my clients who worked for a law firm before she retired a few years ago, she was really, she embraced this idea of reverse mentoring. Every three months, she invited somebody more junior to be her mentor. And junior went, meant one of three things, either literally by age, uh, it could also be more junior within the law firm, or it could be somebody more junior within industry, so within within the law, because she wanted to know, you know, like somebody who just graduated, what are universities teaching mm. law students now? She wanted somebody more junior in the firm to know what um, they may have recruited them from outside, uh, what are you know what are other law firms doing? So it's this idea of um, of thinking wide and going broader. The second thing is just absolutely make sure that you are keeping up to date with your own expertise. Because if you went to university or school uh, 20 or 30 years ago, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's all you need to know. Um, are you keeping up with your professional development to know that you still have the expertise that you need you need for your role now? Um, and the third part is looking ahead. It's looking forward into the future. What's our industry going to look like in five years' time or in 10 years' time? What futurists are you following? Um, what other sources are you using to think about what the future might look like? So if you think about those three areas, am I going wide, am I going deep, and am I going far? There's probably three good indicators for you to consider. Are you doing enough about seeing into the future and, and doing, you, doing what you've been paid to do? Interesting. So maybe double click on that uh, um, uh, in terms of uh, uh, going, looking forward, right? So that's something that um, um, many of uh, uh, the leaders that I speak to, they are so bogged down. I mean, I, I, I know that you know some of them talk widely within their industry, within their organization. Uh, some of them do reverse mentoring as well. But one thing that I definitely don't see many people do is looking forward and looking into the future. So if someone wants to, let's say, develop that ability, uh, what could be a good starting point or what could potentially be one or two, or maybe three tips that you can give them saying that, you know, explore this, stop doing this, or maybe, you know, do more of this. Um, that would that would be really uh, helpful for people to kind of, you know, at least start that mm -hmm. you know, journey of uh, starting to looking forward. Because right now everyone is heads down, yep. um, uh, focused on the current set of reality, yep. and suddenly when they look up and see, you know, the world has changed, um, um, they get uh, into the crisis mode and panic mode. And yes. I see that more and more, um, unfortunately. Yeah, and the reason we're seeing that more and more now, especially now, Mukesh, is we're coming out of a out of a major global crisis, is that. Some people take a long time to come out of the crisis and they, they still feel like they're in crisis mode and we need to put out these fires here or the not mix my metaphors or fix a leak in the boat. And I've spoken to so many leaders in the last 12 months who say our people still are a little bit in that short term thinking, that crisis thinking. So especially after crisis, it's a, it's even more of a challenge for them to think forward. So you talk about the skill of foresight here. So it's actually looking ahead looking over the horizon or around the corner. And, and it has to be done intentionally. It has to be done intentionally because there are so many other things pulling at us, tugging at us, both professionally and personally, that it's not easy to step back and say, I need to do this intentionally. So, whatever, so the first thing I'd say is whatever you choose to do, program it. So program it into your calendar, program it into your schedule. So if you so this and again I'm going to like I'm going to double down on the reverse mentoring because if you if you are let's say you're you're the more junior person who's going to be your mentor is somebody who's literally younger than you so a millennial generation Y or generation Z so generation Z is uh, currently like the age from 12 to 25 
So they're some of the youngest people in the workforce. Um, you know, in countries like India, it's a huge proportion demographically of the population. Um, even in Australia, which is a slightly older population, the millennials now, the generation Y, are the biggest cohort. Right? But let's say you're one of the older generations and you do this reverse mentoring. You're talking about people who are futurists, right? They are, they're already thinking about the future because the future to them is, is literally going to be most, the majority of their life. Um, but okay, let's take that example of reverse mentoring. You set this up, you say every two weeks on Wednesday at 10 o'clock, this is when I have my reverse mentoring meeting with my mentor. Now that's in the calendar. It doesn't mean you can't change it because sometimes things have to change, but at least it's in there as a priority. And if you're going to change it, it's going to be for a very good reason. Similarly, if you're going to uh, be a, like you're going to follow futurists. So for example, at the moment, there's a lot of talk about artificial intelligence. This is something that I've had a lot of experience in my my university degree more than 30 years ago was about AI, but even now there's an explosion of AI tools and I can't keep up with everything. But what I do is I say, so I subscribe to a lot of, a lot of resources in this area and I set aside time in the day to do this. For some people, the easiest time to do that is early in the morning and um, before everybody else comes into work or before the rest of the world takes over. And for me, it's easiest to do last thing in the day. And only for me, this is just personal because I live in Australia, in Western Australia, got lots of clients on the other side of Australia in the afternoon for me in Perth, um, same time zone as Singapore, Mukesh, um, but the rest of the country has finished work. So that's a good time for me to do it. But it's, it's, it's about setting that time and making sure that you make time in your calendar to do that. Um, it might be saying that every Monday afternoon, I'm just picking a time, is when I'm going to be looking further into the future. And that's time that I'm going to set aside for that. Or it might be that you say, every time I come back from lunch, I'm going to spend 15 minutes working on this skill of foresight. So whatever you do in that time, you decide what you do, but you set the time aside and make it a habit. Because uh, one of the things I say is habit trumps discipline. So people think I need to be really disciplined to do this. No, if you make it a habit, just like brushing my teeth every day, uh, twice a day, I do that. I do that. It doesn't matter whether I'm busy or whether I have a quiet day. I always brush my teeth early in the morning and before I go to bed at night. So it becomes a habit. And if you can create good habits around the skills that you want, then that you're more likely to make them happen. Interesting. And I think... Um, um, um... I remember um, uh, I used to work for single wing glass uh, some time back, and uh, this is like almost two decades back. I'm mm -hmm. dating myself, but mm -hmm. one of the things that uh, uh, my at uh, that point in time boss used to do was uh, every team meeting, which is every week, we used to have a, a two and a half hour team meeting, which we kind of you know used to plan uh, the rest of the week. So what he would do is. Uh, Everyone in the team was supposed to go out and explore a particular aspect and come back and report in that team meeting. Everyone got about five minutes. So it was a small team, six people, seven people. So five minutes, seven people um, is not uh, too much time in, in a two and a half hour meeting. And uh, uh, it could be about, for example, I could read a book and report on what I mm. read and how what I read is applicable for my team. Someone could actually have watched a movie and bring in an insight saying that I watched this movie and this is how what I learned and this is how it is applicable to our business. Someone might have read a trend report and come back and say, okay, this is what I heard, uh, uh, read in a trend, re trend report. Someone might have attended a conference. They come back and say, okay, this is what I heard, uh, which I thought I found interesting. So what that did was every week, all of us learned something new. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, not only did we learn something new, by way of uh, someone telling us, but also we ourselves learn something new by doing something uh, new as well. I thought this has stayed with me. I, I've not seen many organizations or many leaders do this, but I thought that it was a brilliant way for everyone uh, in the team uh, to number one, learn by doing, but at the same time, uh, it's learning at scale because every, every week, seven new insights you learn and uh, if if you can actually bring in even one or two of them 
into the work and which improves productivity and improves uh, uh, time you know some of these were always about giving more time to back to us so that you know we can do what we really wanted to do kind of thing so that also yeah. it helped uh, one other thing can I, can I just add one thing to that mukesh because i want to add one other nugget from that which is crucial i think it's really it's a great story fantastic but also what was happening was that your boss was demonstrating that the culture he or she was it a country i forget he said it was a he yeah. um the, it was a culture of learning and he wasn't just him saying we should all be active learners it was him setting aside time and proactively saying we are going to be a team of learners and where and it's valuing learning and um, like again like if you do a and i said this to all to many of the the leaders i work with if you value change if you do a time audit how all the hours that you spend how much of that was focused on change if you think that you're a future ready leader how much time in the last week or two weeks or three weeks or four weeks what percentage of time was spent thinking about the future uh, so yeah it's absolutely and i think this is really crucial and it's fantastic that your boss did that because what they were doing was creating this culture and everybody like you had no doubt that they cared about learning right because they actually devoted time to it and i think that's yeah. crucial yeah and uh, one of the things that uh, i have done in my uh, personal uh, journey of growth is uh, identify uh, a certain set of uh, resources or a set of people so for example uh, i know that uh, i have a reading list which i skim through every single day so i have what um, let's say 50 blogs that i skim through every day uh, and i read out of those 50 blogs that i skim through maybe you know five or six so i have one hour dedicated where i only do that and it is part of my work uh, that i skim those 50 blogs i read five of them and think about them so one hour every day scheduled for this i also identify speakers or uh, thinkers who i know or respect um, for their ability to see into the future so it could be you it could be someone else uh, each one of us knows who those people are within your industry or within your uh, function and uh, follow them uh, if possible talk to them on a regular basis and that also uh, gives you how do you put it um, in in hindi they call it kida uh, um, um, maybe uh, you know if i i can't do a little translation but uh, uh, the translation could be it sows seeds within your fertile mind mm -hmm. which can grow into i don't know what right so but the potential for that remains and it is important for each one of us to identify those maybe three or four people whom we think um, have the ability to kind of you know um, look far look uh, deep and look uh, uh, you know look up right. um, uh, and follow them uh, not only follow them passively but interact with them mm. uh, you know if you can possibly meet them nothing like it if you can speak to them even better but if nothing else interact with them in your mind mm -hmm. uh, that is something that you can always do um, so that's something that i have uh, i have seen benefit me a lot because then uh, it doesn't matter uh, whether the person that i'm following is uh, accessible to me um, uh, as well uh, or not if not then i can have a conversation mental conversation with with that person uh, based on whatever i have learned and that's uniquely human right so you can imagine uh, what his or her response would be based on everything that you know about them or everything yes. that you read about them and that ability to imagine is like in in inanely human and we should probably be uh, using more of that and the ability to reflect on whatever you've learned is also something that um, i think not many leaders uh, put in an effort to reflect on what's happening both in the day to day as well as uh, what could potentially what happened in the past what can we learn from that for the future and what uh, what are, what are some other things that we can look forward uh, to so a quick question around since we are talking about learning and things like that right so uh, i shared about what my uh, learning uh, uh, looks like and what about you so how do you learn and uh, keep keep up 
with everything that's happening? Yeah, so that's a good question, Mukesh. And I think uh, you know this conversation about what are the innate skills that are human, truly human, is a conversation that we're especially having now because we're seeing this growth of AI. And it's really, it's really important that we look at that and um, that the World Economic Forum every few years they publish their future of jobs report. They talk about the skills of the future, and um, every time for the last few um, consistent, consistently the reports, one of them is active learning. So it says that we need to be active learners, not just rest on our laurels on what we learned in the past. And so active learning means continuing to learn, uh, sometimes even unlearning things that used to be true, but uh, aren't necessarily true anymore or don't serve us anymore. Um, so for me as well, I'm, like, I'm a really an active learner. So I pick and choose my, um, my channels that I learn through. And I think this is one of the really valuable things for all of us as learners is to choose what learning style suits us best in terms of frequency and channel. So for me, I'm not very good at watching video. And some people who love watching videos, so I've got friends who spend a lot of time uh, traveling and they fly on planes, so they download TED Talks and then they watch them on video as part of their professional development. I like listening to audio, so I listen to podcasts, I'm riding my bike, I'll go to the gym or go for a run, and when I'm doing other things, I can listen to podcasts and I can listen to them sped up as well. So I, like I also consume TED Talks, but I subscribe to the TED Podcast where I can listen to them in audio. And if there's one that's really visual, then I'll go and watch it. I think it's really worthwhile. So I think it's really important, uh, first of all, to be an active learner, and second, choose the channels that work best for you. So I like reading because um, I can read quickly. And I read on my Kindle, I read on my phone, I can uh, read uh, read pretty fast. But there are other people who love listening to audiobooks rather than the print version or sort of the you know, the, the text version. And uh, for me, like those audiobooks are too slow because I can read faster than I can listen to audio, but I, but audio is faster than watching a video. So make sure you know what channels you're using. Um, so the other thing that I do with, um, well, two other things. So one with, uh, with my learning is part of my job is not just to learn from my own knowledge, but to learn what's valuable for my clients. And so, um, and this is not true for everybody, but for me as a futurist, I know that I've got to be broad. So I, my, my deep expertise is in futurism, it's in um, presenting, it's being a better conference speaker or a workshop presenter. That's my deep expertise. In terms of industries, it's very broad. But I need to know that because I need to tell my clients. Uh, this morning I was talking to clients um, in HR and human resources, talking about the impact of AI in HR. And then tomorrow I'm speaking about um, uh, to speaking to education, speaking to school leaders. Uh, but it, I'm not talking about the, the in depth what does what does HR need to know, but it's giving them an overview. So I always think about is this useful for my clients. The other thing I do is as much as possible. Uh, what I learn, I'll share. So, uh, so I post on LinkedIn and on Twitter, but many of the things I post are things that I've learned. Things like, like I read an article and obviously I can save it for my own reference later, but if I can also share it immediately, then it means that other people are getting value from that immediately. And um, I do that just for, for my own benefit as much as theirs, Mukesh, because I can say, you know what, this was valuable, not just to me to read this and get it, but you know, I'm sharing it. So it is actually worth me putting the time aside to do that. Can I also say that what you said of putting aside an hour a day for learning, um, it, it first of all demonstrates your commitment to learning, uh, but it also is this whole idea of saying um, you commit, you're committing to it in, in a real way. It's not just five minutes while you're waiting for a bus or a train or to pick up copy or waiting for other people to attend the meeting. You have committed to saying, an hour a day is an hour a day is significant, right? Uh, of the 24 hours of the day, if you think about the time that you're awake and you're at work, and um, the number of hours that you've got is pretty limited. And to set aside one of those hours per day is a significant commitment. So you're doing, uh, like you're actually putting time aside for your commitment. So I think that's essential. So for me, what I do is I choose my sources, choose the channels, um, and then share what I can to make it useful to other people as well.
Yeah, and I think sharing also uh, means that you know you're not passively consume the content, but you've reflected on it and um, you kind of you know um, identified what is of value in that piece of uh, uh, micro learning, which is what you share. So you've done internalized a little bit of what you've shared as well, which you can then bring up um, as and when uh, needed in your uh, engagements with your clients as well. Yeah, and also like you know, like I've written a number of books, and that, that we've, we've talked about the disruption book, and most of those, like most of the content of that book, it's not the first time that I'm sharing that. It's the first time it's been put together into a book, but many of them were blog posts or conversations with clients or some some article that I shared on social media got some comments on it, and that deepened my understanding of it. So as I said, that the value of sharing is not just for the people I'm sharing it with. But it's very much for myself as well. So let's step back a little bit and uh, think uh, uh, in terms of you know um, what are some of the other characteristics apart from you know, learning and uh, the ability to uh, look far, wide, and uh, deep. What are some of the key characteristics or abilities that you see uh, leaders uh, need to develop um, in order to be uh, truly future ready? Mm. Uh, Maybe you not know, one, two, three characteristics that you think okay. they need so to one, one which I think is super important is to embrace diversity. So to have diverse voices, have diverse uh, perspectives in your team. And a lot of, like some of that is about lived experiences. So what you want is diverse thinkers, right? So you want diverse thinking. And that might mean that, and where does that diverse thinking come from? Part of that is because of people's history, their background, their lived experience. Now, I often quote this uh, this study that was done at Harvard, where they looked at where do the most creative ideas come from, and they looked at um, carpenters who were supposed to wear safety masks, um, but many of them didn't. So these researchers were saying, how can we get them to wear their masks more without forcing them? And they asked carpenters, they asked uh, roofing contractors, and they asked rollerbladers, people who are inline skaters. And the inline skaters had the better, best ideas for carpenter safety. And part of the reason was because they had very, very different backgrounds and lived experiences. And again, it's a trap for many leaders to surround themselves with people like them. And now we've got complex problems that we're trying to solve in the world. And we need diverse thinkers because we need, complex, we, we need to create complex solutions to those problems. It's, not, it's no longer a case of saying, I've seen this problem 20 times, so it's almost by instinct I know what the answer is. It's just not the case anymore. So the more diversity you have in your team, and that means a number of things. It might mean um, um, have more women in your team or have a mix of women and other genders, um, male, women, other genders. Maybe you want religious and cultural diversity. Definitely want age diversity in your team. And so bring that and people from different industries, different backgrounds. And really, like um, people talk about diversity and inclusion. So diversity is having those people in your team. Inclusion is actually um, using them, using tapping into that diversity rather than uh, only going with the majority of the mainstream. Uh, so I think that's one of the most important things. And of course, around the world, we're seeing more of a focus on that with leaders. And some organizations are doing this really well. Some are you know, still falling behind, lagging behind. So I think diversity is one of them. Um, yeah, I almost can't emphasize that enough. It's <laughs> such an important one. And it's, uh, you know, we absolutely need to do that. Absolutely need to do that. Because our world's much more connected. Our organizations and our communities are much more connected. And the problems we're solving are much more connected as well. So that's the first one. Uh, do you want me to? Uh, yeah, maybe one or, one or two more, maybe. Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah. So the other thing, and I do talk about this in the book as well, is just having clarity. So for leaders to get more clarity, and clarity doesn't mean that it doesn't mean fake it till you make it. It doesn't mean pretend clarity, saying I know what's going to happen. And um, in fact, we don't. And it's better for leaders to say, I actually don't know what's going to happen. So one of the best leaders I know is one of my very good friends. So, um, and she was a very um, a junior leader at the time when she was working for a pharmaceutical company and she was a, um, she had a management role, a leadership role, and the company was going through some um, massive changes. And of course, 
her team was worried about what that meant for them and their jobs. And you know, what she said to them was, look, I don't know what's going to happen. But as soon as I know, I'll let you know. And in the meantime, I'm going to do whatever I can to give you as much clarity as we can uh, and as much confidence as you can, uh, as I can, uh, to, to tread the path now. So it's again, looking, don't know what the future is going to look like, but if I can give you some clarity and confidence, we can make some better decisions now. So I talked about in the book, uh, Reed Hastings, who's a CEO of Netflix, um, and he was um, in, oh, what is the book? What was the name of the book? Um, Rastro, oh, I can't remember. Uh, no Rules Rules. Oh, okay. Yeah. No Rules Rules, yeah. And so he's talking about the idea of trusting people. And he says we need to trust them, like even with information that you may not want to share with them. So if, you, if you're leading a company and it's about to go through some bad times and people are going to lose their jobs, possibly, do you tell people that we're going to be in troubled times and we might lose our jobs, or do you wait for that until they have to until they have to be told, or do you tell them early? And Reed Hastings says, no, we trust them. We tell them as soon as you know. So give them clarity into the future because some of them will leave. Some of them will decide, uh, I don't have enough certainty, so I'm going to leave. Others will say, I'm going to step up and I'm going to help so that we don't go through those tough times. And so the more clarity you can give them, and some people call it transparency, transparency and clarity, and the better the, better the leader that you are. Interesting. So you you make a very uh, how do I put it a point which is very current in terms of zeitgeist which is uh, uh, many many people are being let go um, uh, from the tech industry from many industries um, right so and they are they are being let go in fashions which which uh, which leaves a lot to be desired from from the leadership of of those organizations. So I'm just wondering, I mean, I, I, I'm not asking you for a comment or anything, but I'm just wondering, uh, these are all people who were at one point in time considered as uh, one of the best examples of uh, good leadership, uh, whether it is uh, uh, Satya Nadella uh, or whether it is, uh, you know, uh, Mark or whether it is whoever, right? So they were considered to be the icons of their industry. And the way uh, the current industry has kind of you know, changed and the way they have kind of you know, handled this entire crisis, at least leaves a bad taste for me. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I just wanted to lay it out there. If you want to add something, feel free. Otherwise, uh, that's okay as well. Yeah, okay. Look, look. Uh, so that's something which is slightly controversial, or maybe not, is that, so if you want to know what good leadership looks like, um, on what you should be doing as a good leader, look at what Elon Musk is doing and doing the exact opposite. <laughs> um, but look, and it's, it's interesting, like you see these leaders as icons of leadership, um, but only in terms of how their business has grown. So it's like they've got half of the avocado, right? And uh, when their business is thriving, it's easy, when your business is thriving, it's easy to be a good leader, right? It's easy to be a good people leader. You still need to work to make sure that you have that lead. Um, but it's actually when things are difficult and when things are challenging that you really see how good a leader is as a leader. And uh, I think, yeah, look, look, some of those tech leaders uh, definitely leave a lot to be desired. Um, and, yeah, look, I, I, I will say that, as, as I said earlier on, Mukesh, that we're all called on now to be both parts of this avocado leader. And uh, I think when things are tough, you really see the leaders who've got the, the people skills to lead their people through this. And it's not only the people who let go, it's just as important for the people who are left behind and who are wondering, are we next? Are we next in line for that? And so building that culture and having that culture um, is so important. And so many leaders don't do that well. Mm. I think we've come probably close to the time that we've had we've already maybe in a few minutes um, over for the one hour that we had booked in but if it is okay with you i just wanted to have two further questions before we kind of end uh, end this conversation so the first one uh, is if there is one thing that uh, uh, you wish would change or you wish uh, by a way of magic wand uh, everyone who's in a leadership 
leadership position gets access to this one thing. So mm -hmm. what would that one thing be? And yeah, second, okay, so, and, and I've said this before, I've said this earlier, Mukesh, I think it is like listen to wider, uh, wider perspectives and um, like be a bit more humble around your experience and your expertise. It's absolutely valuable and I don't want to devalue that, but also recognize that there are other perspectives that might be equally valuable, sometimes more valuable. Super. So the, the, the show that I, um, I, I host is called Pushing Beyond the Obvious. Mm -hmm. So what is so obvious to you and everyone misses mm -hmm. that makes you go, ah. Okay, so, so I think one of those things that's, that to me is obvious is that everybody is looking after themselves. Okay, for natural reasons. So the reason I'm saying that is that uh, Often you look at a, look at an organization, look at a leadership team, and you say, why didn't they make this change? It's so obvious. But there are very, very, very good reasons why they didn't. So it's very difficult. So um, there's, a, there's an American author, and he said, Upton Sinclair, Upton Sinclair is his name, and he said, it's difficult to get somebody to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. Right? So it's a little bit cynical, but he said, but this is true for most people, right? For most people, if you say there's an obvious thing that you should do in your business or in your organization, but it might mean that you lose your job, that person will find any possible reason why that's a bad idea and will justify it, will dig in their heels and will say that that will never work. And they may not even admit it to themselves that they're saying that because it it's going to cost them their job. But everyone's looking after themselves. And completely understandable, right? If I'm going to lose my job, it's my career, it's my livelihood, it's my family's future. So why would I want to make this change? And yet, some of the biggest changes have to happen when you disrupt yourself. So I guess the obvious thing, like the obvious thing to me is everyone is looking after a job. And the, the advice I give is disrupt yourself. So I say that disruption and, in, and innovation are both about change. They're exactly the same thing. It's just disruption when the change happens to you is innovation when you create the change yourself. And we all need to be willing to disrupt ourselves. I don't think I can end this conversation in any other uh, uh, fashion or uh, in any other uh, words. So maybe if you can just share a little bit about uh, where can people find uh, information about you? How can people reach you? And if you have any resources, maybe you know, point them towards. Those. Yeah, look, absolutely. So you can definitely find out about me and the, the, the number of web um, websites and domains. Probably the one that's most relevant here, Mukesh, is thefuturist.asia. So you can go there, goes to my website. All my contact details are there. I love having conversations with people. So um, if you drop me a line by email, and if you mention that you heard me on um, this podcast or on this LinkedIn Live, that's really useful because then I'll know and we can have a conversation about follow up about anything there. So I do a lot of conference speaking, mostly around Australia and the region. Uh, so I live like you do, Mukesh, in the world's biggest time zone. And I think it's the world's best time zone because we've got um, you know, already more than a billion people in our time zone and really close to what's going to be our future. The 21st century is very much going to be this Asian century. Um, so yes, yeah, so con contact me through the futurist of Asia and I'd love to take up and continue this conversation. Actually, can I, can I make an offer, Mukesh, that people, yes, please. if you do email me and say you heard about me here, um, I will happily send you a digital copy, a full copy of the book, Disrupted. Very happy to do that for the people who you know, like, are proactive and reach out to me. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, uh, I missed saying this at the start of the session, but uh, I've been watching your YouTube channel Channel and all the sessions that you, uh, uh, the recordings that you post there. And uh, it's uh, my recommendation is that uh, just search for Vihan on YouTube and subscribe to his channel. Uh, a wealth of uh, information and resources available uh, there as well uh, for leaders. So thank you so much for taking time and talking to me today. I I hope that uh, people who are who have listened to this uh, uh, live, some of them did. Um, and the people who will be listening to it uh, uh, going forward as well um, will find that um, it was time well spent. Thank you.